Om Namo Shivaya, 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 Om Namo Shivaya. Om Namo Shivaya. I bow to Shiva, who is God Himself in all forms. I bow to Him in you. I bow to Him above all in my own Gurudeva. I would like to read a story. About the closing years of his life, he went through a severe physical trial at that time to take on, as he said, the karma of many disciples. I would like to think I got in on the act in that, but I really, it hurt me to see him have to go through such pain. But I remember him telling us one time that I held my mind down to the body so that I could experience pain the way other people experience it. And you know, physical pain to a master is not the way it is to you and me. It's just, uh, it's... Not that important. In fact, even you and I can have that kind of willpower. I remember a few years ago, I was at a bank in Italy, and I broke a tooth here because they gave us some bread that was very hard. And uh, my tooth was broken off at the, at the root, and I wanted the uh, thing treated the same the next day. It was on New Year's Day, so it couldn't be done that day, but the day after. So I went to the dentist, and he looked, and he said, well, it's much too close to the gum for an ordinary uh, gl gluing on, whatever they call it, with, the, with their material. So he said that uh, you're going to have to come here four times. I thought, that's a waste of time to come here four times. He said, I'll just do it today. He said, well, I tell you, it's going to be, first of all, I've got to give you anesthesia, and I have to drill in, I have to kill the nerve which is alive, I have to drill, push a post into the gum, and then after that, all that to fit the tooth onto the post, and uh, it's going to be a process. I said, don't worry, I'm just, uh, I figured in my mind, I thought, well, I've lived a long life, and I've had a lot of joy, and I've had a certain amount of pain, and so what are a few minutes of pain? I just said, go ahead and finish it. So I think he was perspiring, and they nurse was with her eyes sort of goggling out that he just went in there and I, I thought about happier things and did meditation and just sort of felt it won't last forever. And it's not as if I had the ability to cut off the, the feeling altogether. I'm all for it, but I couldn't do it. And uh, I remember I had my eyes closed the whole time. I wasn't going to look. At least I wanted to be in a, another world inwardly. And he took the nerve dangling like a little string and a couple of Friends who were with me just sort of saw it and gasped, and then he took this little tiny post and shoved it in there, and then he just stuck the tooth on and put the cement there, and it took about an hour, a lot better than having to go four times down to that man, and I never take anesthesia. It just seems to me I'd, I'd rather have a little brief pain than have to have that numb feeling for hours afterwards, so I don't take anesthesia. And he was, I think, close to fainting, but he did the job, and I got through the job. And the thing is that we can take pain, and we must learn more and more to just not accept it as ours. The more you can do that, the more you find. I've had them do root canal on me and so on. I haven't taken any kind of anesthesia. I've done, I've composed music in my mind. I've, uh, it's true, I don't open my eyes. I don't want to see that man like that. But on the other hand, um, it's brief and it's over with. Well, the gurus have that power. And even though Master brought his mind down to the body so that he could feel pain as other people do, still he was really above it. And I have seen him. Uh, you know, there was one time they dropped a, they had a cement wishing well, an artificial wishing well, and uh, he had his handprints on the concrete, their cement that they were making. And they had this thing, it weighed about a thousand pounds. 
they dropped it in such a way that his foot was right in the middle, right underneath it. They dropped it onto his foot. It broke the foot. And there was a lot of pain there. And his face immediately screwed up in pain. And so he said, look, this is very interesting. He said, watch, I will put my mind here. All of a sudden, every trace of pain vanished from his face. He could walk up and down. No problem. Then he said, now I'll bring my mind down. And suddenly he could see the physical impact of that pain. And he said, now I'll put it here again. He did that two or three times. And uh, his foot was really swollen, but he had to give the service that uh, Sunday in the church. And uh, just before he had to give the service, he didn't want to come out there hardly able to stand. All of a sudden, his body went back into proper shape and he was able to stand, but the whole thing had no more problem. Well, this is, this is sort of a preamble to what I wanted to read you in his book, Conversations with Yogananda. He was telling us this story one time. It was not a usual physical test. It was an astral test. He was describing to some of us for our benefit what he had undergone during his recent illness. This experience was not physical. It was, though it affected the physical body, it was astral in nature. Demonic entities were torturing me. Some of them were shaped like saws, others like corkscrews. They were working on the legs of my astral body. Christ's crucifixion was bad, but at least it was over in a few hours. I, uh, this torture went on for months. Sometimes I kept my consciousness down to the physical body so that I might experience suffering as others do. A nurse was hired to care for me. She was completely materialistic and was actively hostile to the truths we teach here. Every time she turned me over, as she had to do because I couldn't turn myself, she did it with deliberate, unnecessary force, heedless of the pain it would cause. At one point there appeared in my forehead the blue light of destruction. Divine Mother's voice said to me, Give it to her. I could have destroyed that woman with a glance, but I knew this was God's test. Do as you like, Mother, I prayed. It is all your show. He had that power. There was one story he told about this was back in his early years at Mount Washington. There was a woman disciple of his, very close one, Durga Mata, in fact, if you've read her book. And uh, her brother was very antagonistic to her coming and doing uh, this, following this spiritual path. And he wanted to go upstairs and beat up my guru, which had a smaller body. And this man was had a big body and was very strong, but my guru had a very strong body. People didn't know how strong he was physically. But anyway, he was sitting meditating, and he saw these, in his meditation, he saw this young man coming up the stairs with the complete intention of beating up him up and then going around and boasting to everybody that he'd beaten up this so-called charlatan guru kind of thing. And he reached the threshold of the door, and my guru opened his eyes, and he said, I know why you've come. Don't take one step into this room. And the man said, go on, prophet, what are you talking about? He said, I warned you, don't take us, don't walk, don't step into this, across that threshold, into this room. And so arrogantly, the young man strode into the room and suddenly fell down. He said, I'm on fire, I'm on fire. And he felt that his whole body was burning up and he ran downstairs and he was rolling on the ground outside and on the grass, which was somewhat, perhaps, he hoped, cooling to his body. And my guru went down there and touched him and became, healed him of the pain. And he said, don't come near me, don't come near me. And he had his sister go in and take his things, and he ran away and never came back. Now, that's not something that gurus ordinarily do. But they do do it if they have to. It's no, you know, when you're with a master, it's like a live wire. And you touch it, you can get electrocuted. If you commit a fault in the presence of a master, like that story of Tarlanga Swami, a disciple came to him and brought him a, a bucket of lime juice saying it was clabbered milk, and it was poison. If Tarlanga Swami had swallowed it, he would have been killed. Instead, as he drank it easily because he was a master, and the man fell down screaming, and uh, 
he finally prayed to be forgiven his sin and Dalanga healed him. He said, now that you know the divine meaning of boomerang, never do this again. And what my guru explained, this is all in autobiography of a yogi, and it's a very interesting thing too, that a guru, having overcome his ego, is able to overcome the thwarting cross-currents of ego, which delay the operation of karma, so that when you do something, you think you've gotten away with it. You haven't. That karma is waiting in the trees. It'll get you sooner or later. Somebody uh, said, well, uh, to a, a guru, he said, well, what is this teaching that you go into the Ganges and you become freed of all your sins? And the guru said, oh, yes, it's perfectly true. You go into the Ganges and you're pure, but your sins wait in the trees. And when you come out of the Ganges, they leap on you all over again. Nothing so simple as just bathing in the Ganges is going to purify you of incarnations of sin. Don't be ridiculous. The beautiful little myths that gather in religion use your common sense, too. You have to work hard to become free. Look at Buddha. Look at the Yogananda. Look at all the great saints. They've had to go through a great deal. Now, the thing is that... Uh, when you, when you are in the presence of a master, don't ever tell a lie. Don't ever be uh, harsh. One time my guru told about a time when uh, he, someone whom he had given his love to turned against him. And my guru's comment was that when, not to him, he said it to us afterwards. He said, you know, when you give your divine love to somebody and he goes against that love and tries to hurt you, he crucifies himself. It isn't the guru curses you. This is a mistake. It says that in the Upanishads and so on. But it's not that the, a true guru would curse anybody. But sometimes he will say, this will be the result of your action. That's not a curse. That's just telling you what's going to happen. And in the presence of a guru, whatever you do receives much more rapid payment than otherwise. One time my guru... Uh, a disciple struck my guru in public. His hand was paralyzed for six months. It wasn't that my guru said, oh, I'll get even with you. No. But there was no ego there. The guru didn't think I'm being struck. And so that man's karma, which had to come, you strike a guru, you're striking God. It's not like what will happen to just anybody. You'll have to pay it. And with that grace, you will pay it right away. One time, Dr. Lewis was, uh, he's, he was with Master, and they saw a man with a club foot. And Dr. Lewis said, well, why, does, why was he born with that club foot? Master said, because he kicked his mother in his last life. That karma comes to you sooner or later. And so remember that what the guru was doing was paying for our karma. He was, you know, when you, if, if a huge man comes to punch you in the jaw, he could kill you. But if a strong man stands in the way, he can take that punch. It won't kill him. It may shake his body up, but it won't kill him. And so the guru, seeing the kind of karma that each disciple has to pay, sometimes he will step in the way of some of that karma because he can take it. The disciple, it would destroy him for this incarnation and he'd have to go on to another incarnation. Mind you, the, the incarnations themselves mean nothing to a master. There was a, a story my guru told me of Shankaracharya. There was this woman who was always doubting, what if this, what if that? And finally, one day, she said to him, well, what if I die? And Shankaracharya said, well, die then. And she fell over dead. You might think, well, that's a pretty drastic teaching. But after all, her soul remembered. And it was the kind of lesson she needed. She was always going to go through life with this hangdog expression, what if this, what if that? Don't forget that when you express negative expectations, fears, and so on, you will, you will draw that to yourself. Any kind of thought that you send out with energy creates a magnet, just like electricity when it goes through a wire, creates a magnetic field. Your desires and your strong thoughts, and the stronger they are, the sooner they manifest themselves and the more they manifest themselves. And this is even the truer when you are with a guru, that the, you bring that power to you very quickly. Don't, don't uh, play around with saints. Don't play around with uh, 
uh, high truths. I know I was in Bali one time, and uh, I gave somebody to get some furniture for our center in America, and he didn't get it. And I asked a friend of mine to go there and get it. And the man had used it for himself. And when this friend of mine came, he was really trembling. He said, I know he was a sadhu. I don't want to. I'm afraid of his cursing me, and I've been feeling very badly. Well, I wouldn't curse anybody, but I'm glad that he did send it, because otherwise it wouldn't have been good for him. Do be aware, however, that whatever you do, sooner or later, there may be what Master called the thwarting cross-currents of ego, but sooner or later they will catch you wherever they are, wherever you are. You can't escape them. You can hide in the deepest cave and they'll still find you. You can't escape your karma by going off to a cave in the Himalaya. It will follow you. It will smell you out and catch you where you are, wherever you are. So try to create good karma and try to have good thoughts. And when you do go into the presence of saints, don't go with worldly thoughts. You won't get what they have to give you. And you might even, in fact, be electrocuting yourself because that disharmony in you will have a negative effect upon you. So, love God. There is this beautiful chant in Bengali, which my guru translated into English, and we will sing it for you. A group of us will sing it, but let me first sing it, not in the true original melody, but in the same melody as the, the uh, English version. Jabe ki he din amar Bihole choriye, divanishi achi boshi, asha potho nirokye, ridayo kutiro dwar, kola ache oni bar, doyak kore ekabar, eshe ki jurabe hiye. We'll sing this to you now in English. Joy to ye. Just for once, come to me. Wilt thou come? Wilt thou come? Just for once, come to me. Will my days fly away without seeing thee, my Lord? Will my days fly? Yeah. 